so we've talked about incentives and we talked about um, the trade-offs that happen when prices go up. You have to decide if you want to continue to buy something. Um, and that's this idea of elasticity. Um, but next we need to think more about um, this idea of constraints um, and the trade-offs that you have to make within the constraints that you face. Um, and so a good example of this, again, if we were in person, we would have this fun activity where we would fold a whole bunch of paper airplanes. I would divide the class up into four different groups. Um, some of the groups would only have two people in them. Some of the groups would have like eight people in them or 10 people in them. And each group would then compete with all of the groups to fold as many paper airplanes as possible. And the paper airplanes would have to meet these specifications here. They would have to be folded in this manner. It has to have this little notch cut down at the bottom here. Um, and so what we do in this simulation is each group, regardless of group size, in the very first round of doing this, you have three minutes to fold as many paper airplanes as you can, but only one person can work. So if you have a group of 10 people, nine people are going to sit around and watch, and one person's going to do all of the folding. If you have a group of two people, one person's going to do all of the folding and one person's going to watch. So what we do is we, we measure how fast or we measure how many paper airplanes people can make in the three minutes in these different groups. And then we go on to the next round where I allow more workers to join. And so each group can have two workers and then each group can have three workers. Um, and then I say after that, each group can have however many workers they want. And then we calculate how many airplanes each of these groups are able to make within three minutes. And the fun thing about this is you would think that the group with 10 people in it would be able to make a ton of airplanes. And the people with two people in it would be able to make just a few airplanes. And that is generally the case, but it is not as direct of a relationship as you would think. Um, if you're a group of two people, you can make, let's say, 10 airplanes in, in three minutes. If you're a group of four people, that does not mean that you can make twice as many. Um, you're not going to be able to make 20 airplanes. Um, you actually make a little bit less. And as you increase the group size, um, the number of airplanes that people can make in these groups actually starts decreasing, um, which is fascinating. And it happens everywhere where people do this. And so this is from um, a university in Colombia in an intro microeconomics class there in 2008. Somebody ran the same experiment. And what they found is, um, as you increase the number of workers in these little groups or in these little firms here, um, you get more airplanes. So when you're down to like two people, you're getting just a few airplanes. As you increase it up to like 15 people in a group, you're making almost 17, 16, 17 airplanes. That's cool. Um, but notice how this is not a direct line. You're not going from two people and then suddenly because you're at uh, 15 people, you're not making like 40 airplanes or 50 airplanes, um, this curves down. Um, and it's because the benefit that you get from adding additional workers actually starts disappearing. And you can create less stuff as you um, add more people to the mix. Um, what happens in these larger groups is people get in the way. Um, people try to make assembly lines, but then it gets too unwieldy. Um, with one person folding one wing and then passing it and then folding another wing and that gets weird and it slows down the whole process. Um, and so what, what ends up happening is you get less and less over time. Um, you do improve over time. So if you look at, at this, um, this is again the same graph, but each of these lines is the rounds. So in the first round, they're not making as many airplanes and then over time they're getting better and better and better. And by the time you get to round four, um, people are really good at folding airplanes, and so that has improved the number of airplanes people are making. But again, that curve is getting bent down, um, where if you have a small firm, if you double the size of that firm, you're not going to get twice as many airplanes out of it um, because the, the amount of airplanes you're producing actually starts decreasing. The amount is still positive, but the amount of new airplanes you get from adding one additional worker starts going down. And this is a principle in economics called diminishing marginal product. Um, so this graph right here, this is from um, that same graph from the, the group in Colombia, um, where it shows the number of planes made by these number of workers. And so if you have a group of two, they're going to make three planes. If you have a group of four, they're going to make six planes. That does double it. Neat. Um, if we double that from four to eight, you would think you'd go from six airplanes to 12 airplanes, but we're actually going from six to 11. 
um, we start decreasing there. And you can actually look at that as you go from one worker to another. So if we go from one worker to two, that's an increase from 1.5 to three, that's 1.5, that's cool. Um, going from two to three, that's an increase of two. But then we go from three to four, that's an increase in one, increase in one, 1.5, 1.5, one, only a half, only half. So if you look at, as you're going up with the number of workers, the number of airplanes you're making starts shrinking even more. So you're going from 12 to 12 and a half to 13.25, to 13.5, to 13.75, to 14, eventually it's gonna hit a point where it's flat, where if you add an additional worker, you're actually not gonna be able to make more airplanes, and that worker is not gonna help your process. Um, so what this is called is, there's it's the product that you're making. This average product is the number of airplanes you're making per worker. Um, so if, you're, if you have eight workers, um, we're making 11 planes, so the average product is going to be planes per worker. So it's 11 divided by 8, whatever that is. Um, math is tricky. Um, so that would be the average product. We don't really care about the average product. We care about the marginal product. So in economics, anytime you hear the word marginal, all that means is one more, or it is the product that you get from adding one additional worker. Um, so the marginal product in this situation is saying, as we move from one to two, how many additional planes are we getting? And that's, you're getting one and a half more planes. As you move from two to three, how many additional planes are you getting? You're going from three to five, that's two more airplanes that you're getting. So that is a pretty high marginal product. Once you get up into this world though, going from 12 to 13, your marginal product is only a quarter of an airplane. That is very low. Um, compared to this world down here where you're, you add one more worker and you're like almost doubling the amount of output you have. You're, in, you're going from three to five, that's cool. Um, up here you're going from 13.5 to 13.75, which is not that great of an increase. So this right here, this idea of, of marginal product, over time as you increase the number of workers and increase the number of inputs to some process, you're eventually gonna start hitting limits and um, not be able to create tons of stuff. And so it creates this idea called diminishing marginal product, where as you increase stuff, um, the, or as you increase inputs, the amount of stuff that you can create starts decreasing unless you can increase the input. So if you could, like with this worker idea, it starts decreasing because there's not enough room for everybody to work at the table. If you could add an extra table, then people could spread out and then that could help increase the product. But then you keep adding more workers and you're gonna get crowded at that table. And so then it's gonna start diminishing. And so you want to add another factory or add something else to expand the ability to make stuff, but then it's gonna start decreasing again. Um, and so that's this idea of diminishing marginal product. And you saw this in your reading here, um, where you saw a graph that looked like this when you read about Alexi and his choice to um, study or have free time. Um, we can do that, that same graph that we had that showed the diminishing marginal product for airplanes. We can create that same thing, but we just reverse it here. So instead of saying the number of workers, um, this is the number of free workers. So zero means everybody's working, so all 15 people are working full speed. Um, as you increase this, if you go to 20 free workers, that means like nobody's working. And so this shows the number of planes that you can make given the number of free workers. And in the Economy, Society, and Public Policy reading, um, what you learned was this section right here is called the feasible set. Anything in this area is possible to make. So if you have if you want to have 10 free workers in your organization, in your firm, um, and you want to make only six planes, you totally can. Um, there's nothing against that. You can make your, your six planes here. Um, we can draw it here. We can't draw it. We can draw it with this pen here. So you can, arrow, not arrow. Let's we'll switch to the pen. There we go. So if you have, if you want to have 10 free workers and only make six planes, you can totally hit that point and that is totally feasible. Um, you're not going to make as many airplanes as you could 
if you had 10 free workers, you could go up to like 12 planes. You could make a lot more planes. Um, so being down here within this feasible set isn't great. It's not super efficient. You want to be kind of on this limit here. Um, the official term for this limit is something called the production possibility frontier, um, which sounds really exciting, but it really just means like this is the limit of what you can do given your constraints. You have some number of free workers. These are the number of planes you can create. If you want to have 20 free workers and make 15 planes, that's right here, you can't actually hit that point. That's beyond the production possibility frontier and you can't do that. Um, you don't have the resources to do that. Um, there's actually, in this situation, there's no way to make 15 planes ever. Um, even if you go full speed, having no free workers, hiring everybody possible, you can only ever make 14 planes and that's kind of your limit. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what you're limited by is this production possibility frontier. Um, so we saw this in your reading with Alexi. Um, we saw this same graph here where he had to decide um, how much he wanted to study for a test. Um, and this shows his production possibility frontier. Given one input, the only input he has here is time spent studying. Um, and the way it's measured here is hours of free time per day. So if he's down here, he has zero hours of free time per day. He's spending all of his time, 24 hours in a day, studying. Um, if you're down in this range, 20 hours of free time a day, it means he's only spending four hours working on, on homework and academic stuff and spending the rest of his time doing other stuff. So that's what this is measuring here. Um, this production possibility frontier shows what his grade would be depending on how he spends his time. If he spent every single waking hour on studying and academic stuff, and that was all he was doing, his grade would be 90. Um, and that, that would be his limit if he knows himself really well and could read his mind and see the future and know that that would happen. Um, the neat thing about this is if he knows that, if you look at the shape of this, he could also have eight hours of free time a day and like sleep and that would put him right here and he would get the same final grade. So there's no point for him to spend no free time versus eight hours of free time. He's going to get the exact same output. So if you're Alexi, don't choose this point. That's a bad point there because that's a waste of your time. You can hit this point right here and get the exact same grade, but also have more free time. Um, so any point on this frontier here is something that is feasible, that is something that is doable. So point A, he could have 13 hours of free time a day and get like a 92 on his, or that's like an 85, sure. He can get an 85 for his final grade if he had 13 hours of free time a day. Neat. Um, point B right here is out of his feasible set. He cannot hit that point. He cannot have 20 hours of free time a day and get a 70. That is not possible. If he spent, if he had 20 hours of free time a day, he would not get a 70. He would get whatever point this is here, which is like a 50, I think. And that's what he would get. Um, if he had 19 hours of free time a day, that gives him a 58 on his final test here. So all of these points here on the line are kind of the extent of, like there's the limit of what he can do given his constraints of time. If he's within this feasible set here, if he has 10 hours of free time a day, but only gets a 70, that's not efficient. In theory, he should be able to get a 90 or like an 89 if he has 10 hours of free time a day. So D is definitely feasible, but it's not kind of the best possible thing. It's not kind of fulfilling everything that he wants to do. Um, so everything under this whole production possibility frontier here is called the feasible set. Anything on that line or below that line is possible given his constraints of time here. Um, and so we care about that because like all of these points here are something that you can do. Um, and like we saw with the airplanes where if you're adding more workers, um, there comes a point where adding one more worker isn't actually gonna get you a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's not gonna make you get a whole bunch of more airplanes. And so there are specific points in this feasible set where it's worth it for him to do an extra hour of studying, to take away one of his hours of free time, and that will boost his grade by a lot compared to boosting his grade later. So 
what we have here, if we look at this table down here, if he is at point F right here, he's having he's currently having 20 hours of free time a day, and he decides that he wants to spend one additional hour on studying, so he's gonna move from 20 to 19. So he's just moving from here to there. That will change his final grade from a 50 to 57. So that's a seven point difference right here. That's going from 50 to 57. Um, which is a big change for one hour of studying. So he's he's giving up one hour of free time, moving from nineteen from twenty to nineteen, and gaining seven points by doing that. If he's up here though, with fourteen hours of free time, and decides to give up one additional hour and spend an, a little bit extra time studying, he would move from point E to point A, right there, because that's again moving from just one hour in. But the amount of points that he's going to get, he's going to move from an 81 at 14 hours to just 84 at 13 hours, which is only a three-point change. So he's not going to gain a ton by studying an extra hour up in this world here. It gets even worse when he goes from like 9 to 8. Um, here at 9, he's going to get like an 89. And then at 8, he's going to get a 90. So he could spend an extra hour studying for the sake of one point, which maybe isn't worth his time if he's already at that point. If he's down here in this world, going from from this point F to this point C, that's a huge gain that he can get from doing one extra hour of studying. That's, that's big. Um, up here, that's not very big. So that change right here, that slope, how steep it is going from F to C, um, if we drew a line there, that slope is fairly steep. That's not the greatest line in the world. Imagine that it is nice and straight. Um, and so it's going up fairly steep here. If you're up at A and E and we draw a line, that slope is not as steep. It's more flat. If we go from this point to this point, that slope is even flatter. Um, and so kind of how steep that slope is is how much benefit you get from spending one extra hour studying or one adding one extra worker to create airplanes or whatever. Um, and you want to make it so that you get more gains from doing that. There's an official term for this in economics, and it's called the marginal rate of transformation. So the, what we're transforming in this case is we're transforming free time to grade. Um, or in the case of the airplanes, we're transforming workers into airplanes. Um, and so this marginal rate of transformation is basically measuring um, how many additional grade points you get by giving up one hour of free time, or how many more airplanes do you get by adding one additional worker. So that's this marginal rate of transformation. Um, it is also something called opportunity cost, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, mathematically, it is just the slope of this line right here. The bigger that is, the steeper the slope is, and the higher the marginal rate of transformation. The flatter it is, the lower the slope, and the lower the marginal rate of transformation. Those are all the same thing. They're all synonyms here. So what this is, is it's the opportunity cost. So if he wants to give up, so if he's at point C right here, and his friends say, hey, you should come party with us, or I want to watch an extra show on Netflix, or I want to go to bed an hour early, to do that, he's going to give up one of his hours of free time and go for, or he's going to get an extra hour of free time and move from 19 to 20, which means he's going to lose seven points in his grade because he's giving up or he's, he's um, getting one extra hour of free time. And that's a pretty costly extra show on Netflix um, because he's giving up seven points. If he's up in this world, though, he's currently a point A and his friends say, hey, you should stop studying and come hang out with us for an hour. He could, that would move him down to point E. So he's gonna give up three points on his um, exam or on his final grade, which isn't a huge thing. If he's up in this world and he has like only eight hours of free time and somebody says, hey, you need to take a break, spend an hour not doing homework, um, then he's gonna move to this point here and get the exact same grade. And so the opportunity cost there is zero, like the slope is, is nothing. Um, so that is, that is what this opportunity cost looks like in a graph like this. More 
generally, this idea of opportunity cost is sometimes hard to wrap your head around, but it's a really central principle to microeconomic thinking. Um, and this is why I had you look at this reading right here, this one comic or one panel comic that was in your reading list, um, where if you're going to spend a ton of time driving around the city to find the cheapest gas, um, it ends up kind of wasting your time doing so. Um, and this, you probably all know people in your lives that really, really care about gas prices and they will spend an extra 10 minutes to go find gas that is three cents cheaper um, in a different city. And it's not worth it because you're actually giving up, um, you're spending all of that extra money to get there, but you're also giving up your time. Um, you could be doing something else with your time um, instead of driving an extra 20 minutes to get slightly cheaper gas. Um, and so that's kind of this core, this core idea behind opportunity cost. Um, another way of thinking about it is um, it's the value of the thing that you can't do because you've made a decision. Um, or it's the value of the foregone option. So in the case of Alexi studying, um, if he stops studying for an extra hour and decides to watch a show on Netflix for an hour, um, then the value of that hour that he gave up of studying is the number of points that he's going to lose on, the, on his final score because of that. So that is this opportunity cost idea. Um, another way of thinking about it is um, right here. This is a car wash in Utah. Um, when I finished my PhD program um, and got my first professor job at BYU in Utah, we had to drive from North Carolina to Utah. And it was a long drive. Um, I drove with four kids. Um, my dad flew out to help us drive. My wife was pregnant at the time. She didn't want to drive with us, so she flew separately, which was great for her because while we were driving across the country, three out of our four kids um, started vomiting in the car. And it was disgusting and not the greatest um, road trip ever. Um, they were just constantly vomiting. We invented this system where they could like throw up into this plastic uh, Ziploc bag, like one of those gallon bags, and we could zip it up and dump it at the next gas station. And it was miserable. Never drive across the country with kids who were just vomiting. Um, it's disgusting. And so once we got to Utah, the car was like this toxic dump and miserable, like it, it stunk so bad. Um, and so what, what we did is... Um, I decided to go get it washed, which was a big thing for me because I had just finished being a PhD student with like no income. And what I had done for the five years of being a PhD student is whenever I wanted to get the car washed, I would do it myself because I didn't want to spend the money to do it. Um, my time was not super valuable at that point. I didn't have like a great job that paid me lots of money or any money. Um, and so I didn't want to spend the money to have somebody else wash the car for me. Um, and so I would always wash the car and vacuum it on my own after we did like beach trips or whatever. And like, that's just what I did. Um, but once we got to Utah, um, I did not want to deal with that van that was disgusting and, and horrible and terrifying. Um, and so it was worth it to me to not spend time um, washing the car. I could have done it in like an hour or two hours or whatever, but I valued my time differently since I then had a job. Um, and so I didn't want to do that. And so instead I opted to pay somebody else to wash the car for me, um, which was great. Thank goodness for this place because they dealt with it and it was wonderful. Um, in regular economics textbooks, what the argument is, is if you want to choose to outsource something, um, because you can make more money doing something else, then you typically make more money doing something else. And so you have somebody wash your car while you do whatever it is that gets you money, whatever your hourly wage is, you can do that. Um, in reality, that never happens. I sat on my phone for two hours here in the car wash while other people did it. I didn't earn extra money because I, I gave up that, that chance to wash my car. Um, but the principle holds. Um, before I had a job, um, it was not worth it to have somebody else wash the car for me because I could do it for cheaper. Um, but as soon as I had like income, um, that calculus changed and it was worth it for me to pay somebody to do it while I didn't um, because the value of my time had changed. Um, it's not always the value of your time. Um, you can also put value on washing things. If you get 
um, intrinsic motivation and intrinsic utility for doing stuff, you really like washing cars, then that actually factors into your calculation. And so even if you do get like income, um, you're not going to necessarily want to outsource everything because you also get intrinsic utility for doing stuff. And so you're not going to necessarily want to go with the cheapest option um, or outsourcing. Um, so a another way of looking at this, um, especially with this idea of like uh, the internal value that you place on things, um, is suppose you have a choice that you can either go to a concert of some music group at a theater and the tickets for that theater concert are $25. You'd have to buy a ticket for $25 and then you can go to this concert that you really like. Um, or there is a free concert sponsored by the city that you live in, um, in a park. And so you could go to that concert for free. So you can either spend $25 to go to a concert in a theater, or you can spend $0 and go to a concert in a park. Um, if you are, if you have no preference for any of those things, you're going to go for the cheapest option. It's $0. You're going to go to the free concert. But if you care about you know, the value of the, of, like you care about the group that is performing in the theater, then that suddenly changes your calculation. And you all do this in your head. You just don't know you're doing this in your head and you don't know the math behind it. But this is, this is how this would work. So what you would do is you'd ask yourself, how much would I be willing to pay for a ticket to go to this concert in the park? It's free. Um, but maybe it's just like some local group I've never heard of. I would pay them like five bucks to go to this concert. Who cares? Um, and so in that case, you're going to go like it, it's not great. Um, but if it's super valuable, it's like a really famous group that's coming to this park and it's free, then suddenly it's free and you, you're going to want to go to it. And so you ask yourself this question. So let's say you say this, this uh, concert in the park I'd be willing to pay $15 to go to this concert, but it's free, so that's neat. So I'm gonna save $15 if I decide to go to this, this concert in the park, okay? So that's this difference here. What we have here is something called the economic cost. This is different from the accounting cost. The accounting cost of going to the theater is $25. The accounting cost of going to the park is $0. That's the actual money that you spent. The economic cost incorporates the opportunity cost into the actual price. And so here, the economic cost of going to the theater is the price that you pay for going to the theater. You're going to give up $25, but you're also giving up the next best option. You're giving up $15. It's not actual $15, but you'd be willing to pay $15 for that um, by not going to the park. You're giving that up and you're going to the theater instead. And so the total economic cost of this example is $40. And that feels weird because you're not actually spending $40. You're only spending $25. Um, but you're incorporating this next best option. You're giving up $15 of benefit by going to the theater. So that's, that's this, this economic cost of the theater is $40. So remember that number here. So that still doesn't tell us where we should go if we should go to the theater or go to the park. And this is where, again, you need to read your mind and determine how much you value the theater concert. So you ask yourself, how much, like I'm paying $25 for this theater concert, but how much would I be willing to pay in total? If the ticket was $50, would I still want to buy it? Would I still want to go? And if so, then um, that value here is greater than this $50 You'd be willing to spend $50 um, to go to the theater. You're only spending 25 plus this 15 for the park. And so that's greater than 40. And so you're going to go to the theater. If the theater concert isn't that valuable to you, um, for instance, if you like the tickets are $25, you'd be willing to spend up to $35 for them. Um, but that's like, you're okay with it. Um, like you're not going to spend $40. You're just going to spend a little bit more. Um, what ends up happening is this 35 here is lower than the economic cost of going to the theater, which means you are actually going to choose to go to the park, the free concert in the park, because you actually gain more benefit by doing that. Here, you're 
spending $40, not actual dollars, you're spending $25, but you're also giving up 15 for not going to the park. If this is only worth $35 to you, that's less than kind of everything you're giving up. And it would be better for you to not spend that $25 and to go to the free concert in the park and get the, the $15 of benefit. So that's kind of the math behind this idea of opportunity cost here. Um, it's a weird concept. If I were you, I'd spend lots of time staring at this here um, and just wrapping your head around this idea, tinker with these different numbers. If the value of the park was like $50, then suddenly, um, like if it was like a really famous band, you'd be willing to pay up to $50 for a ticket, um, but you don't have to, it's free. If that was 50, then the economic cost of going to the theater means that you're gonna spend $25 and you're giving up $50 of benefit, and so that's 75. So if you're only willing to spend $50 for the theater tickets, it's gonna be better to go to the park because that's less than the 75. And if the theater concert don't, like, is only worth $35 to you, you're still gonna want to just go to the park because that's a really cool concert. So this is the math behind your reasoning. Um, if you decide to get a car wash, this is the same process that you go through in your head. Um, instead of theater concert versus park concert, you're saying cost of paying somebody to wash my car versus value of washing the car on my own. Um, and so you put some dollar amount, you say it's worth $5 to me to, to enjoy washing my car. And then you go through this calculation in your head. Um, same thing for driving around for gas. You can say, what is the cost of, of finding the best gas place? And what is the intrinsic value I get from finding the cheapest gas place? Um, there are people really do get enjoyment out of find, finding the best prices, sure. But if that is not offset by kind of the benefit of doing that, then you're not going to do it. So again, wrap your head around this concept here. And this is kind of the math behind your decision process in your head when you have to decide between two options. Um, you've probably never thought about it this way in, in these mathy terms, but that's, that's how economists think about this, with this idea of opportunity cost. Um, so, so far we've been talking about dollars. Um, you get $25 of benefit and $50 of benefit, and that's neat um, because we can put actual like dollar amounts on that. But in real life, we don't always work with dollars, especially like how many dollars of benefit do I get for washing my car? I have no idea. Um, that is meaningless to me. I don't measure happiness in dollars. And so what economists do is instead of working with dollar amounts, um, they'll often work with something called utility. And this is a made up number. It's not an actual thing that is measurable. You can't read people's minds and figure out the utility they get from something. You can't measure any of this stuff. Um, another way of thinking about them is happiness points. Um, how many points of happiness do you get from doing something? Um, and so a good example of this is, let's say here's this ice cream. Um, if I asked all of you to write down on a piece of paper, how many happiness points you would get from eating one bowl of ice cream, um, it would be all over the map. Some of you would write down 10 happiness points. Some of you write down one happiness point. Some would write down like 3 million happiness points. Um, and great, cool. Um, the issue with that is you can't compare any of those happiness points with each other's. Um, so if two of you, one of you writes down 10 and one of you writes down 100, that doesn't mean the 100 person likes um, ice cream 10 times as much as the other person. They just have a different scale of happiness. So like if somebody gets 3 million happiness points, like they're all meaningless. Um, from like the TV show, The Office, these are like shroot bucks. They're just like fake numbers. So if you ever have a test question or a problem set question that says person X gets 10 um, units of happiness from something and person Y gets five units of happiness from something, who gets more happiness? there's no answer. You can't compare across these people um, because you don't know what the exchange rate of happiness points is between these two people. You can't make what are called interpersonal um, comparisons of utility across people. Um, so that's one key point with this utility thing. It's these fake happiness points that just kind of exist in your heads and you can't really compare them with anybody. Um, the other 
fun thing that happens with utility is like we had with the diminishing marginal product as you keep adding more workers or as you keep um, adding more time to studying um, the amount of airplanes that you create or the amount of grade points that you generate starts decreasing um, the marginal benefit you get from from adding an additional worker starts going lower and lower the same thing happens with utility so if you say let's say you get 10 points of happiness for eating one bowl of ice cream and then what would happen if you did two bowls of ice cream maybe that doubles your happiness and you get 20 points and if you eat a third bowl you're probably not going to triple your happiness you're probably going to start getting like maybe of 25 points for three bowls and if you eat four bowls all at once it's probably not going to be a ton it's probably going to be like 26 or 27 um, because it's going to start flattening out because you're going to start getting full and tired of stuff um, you can't just eat bowls and bowls of ice cream over and over again you're going to get sick you're limited by like your stomach size um, with the amount of happiness that you can get out of um, consuming stuff and so this idea of diminishing marginal stuff also applies to utility um, as you increase the number of bowls of ice cream you get you get less marginal utility your utility is still going up but the slope starts shrinking um, so here in these early bowls going from zero bowls to one bowl that's a pretty steep slope right there um, that's a big jump in happiness but if you're going from four bowls right here to five bowls that line right here is fairly flat it'd be great if i could draw a straight line but i can't um, but if you notice that's pretty flat compared to this really steep slope over here so adding an additional bowl of ice cream lowers the amount of marginal utility you get as you increase that and so that will continue to diminish here actually of it going down because you'll start feeling sick and then you lose happiness um, but that's again kind of this main principle of utility here is that the more you consume um, the less marginal benefit you get from the thing um, and so that is utility